You might notice something a bit different about my co-host today. Hello! <laughs> Namely, that it is not Ian. That's right. I'm taking over Carry the Two. So I'm like, carry the one, carry one, carry prime. <laughs> and I thought I was the master of bad jokes. Jeez. Uh, anyways, we both wanted to give Ian a break and welcome Carrie as co-host for this particular episode. Carrie is here to walk us through the incredible research project that she and an interdisciplinary team conducted here at MC over the course of a single month. Oh, but shouldn't we introduce who we are before we get into all that? Oh yeah, right you are. Um, <clears throat> are you really gunning for my podcast host gig? <laughs> Welcome to the podcast, Carrie the Two. I'm Sadie Witkowski. And I'm Carrie Diaz Eaton. And you're listening to a podcast from the Institute for Mathematical and Statistical Innovation, aka MC. This is usually the podcast where Sadie and Ian talk about the real world applications of mathematical and statistical research. But today we're changing it up with Carrie joining me as co host. You might remember Carrie from the very first episode that we ever put out. In that episode, you interviewed me about research looking at equity and inclusion in STEM education policy documents. That's right, but rather than having you as a guest for this project, we thought it would be more fun to have you as a co-host and feature the voices of all the different team members who worked on this project. Speaking of which, I'm new to this podcasting thing, but have we explained what Vecina is yet? Not yet. Uh, why don't you do the honors? For this episode of Carry the Two, we're going to lead you through a collaboration project between a collection of mathematical researchers and Nuevas Voces. The project, VACINA, is actually an acronym for Providence VACINA, Visualizing Environmental and Community Information for Neighborhood Advocacy. But for you non-Spanish speakers, VACINA is the feminine form for the word neighbor. Aptly named, huh? <laughs> yep. But to be more specific, my research group collaborated with Nuevas Voces to develop a community-driven, data-driven advocacy tool to help empower community members to advocate for their needs, particularly in the context of climate change. And to clarify, this is an ongoing project, but the majority of the work is what we're talking about here today. And that was conducted at MC this January, with the big goal being to create a usable tool for Nuevas Voces. And to introduce Nuevas Voces, let's hear from Becca Greenwald and Jenny Mercado. I am the Grants and Grants Programs Manager at Wunasquatucket River Watershed Council. Our watershed spans six cities in six cities and towns in Rhode Island, but most of our work is focused on the Olneyville neighborhood of Providence, Rhode Island, adjacent to downtown. And it's an impaired neighborhood with a lot of historical and um, climate change related challenges. So Rebecca is part of the WRWC, as it's abbreviated, and they are the sponsoring organization for Nuevas Voces. That's uh, new voices in Spanish for folks who didn't know. This is a program that's like very close to um, my values, my heart, my history, uh, my commitments in the world. It's something that I feel like has been a long time coming for the organization, and I'm really proud to have been a part of what is now a, a more significant cultural shift and transition in the organization. The Wunasquatucket River was once most dioxin-contaminated waterway in the country. And the WRWC organization has been working to restore the ecology, and recreational use of the watershed. Nuevas Voces provides cohort support for community leaders from one of the hardest hit and underserved communities in the watershed, Olneyville. To make sure that Carrie's group was taking a community-driven approach rather than building a tool and assuming people would use it, representatives from Nuevas Voces were invited to join the researchers at MC and lead discussions on their specific needs with an initial focus on flooding. Here's what Jenny Mercado from Nuevas Voces thought of the experience. 
I actually have to say that I was so excited to be there and be able to be part of this project because um, for us here in the community, we needed a new tool to provide the community with new um, tools to go go ahead and 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 search for the need the things that they need. Um, so I was super excited to be part of it. And at first I was a little scared because there's a lot of people that um, they know obviously more than us. I mean, we know from the point of view of us community, we know the needs of the community. And, but when it comes to put it on paper or to put it out all together in a, in a whole new uh, tool or, or a web page, it's, it's, you know, it requires people with professionals, skills and the knowledge. Jenny points out, two really important things. First, Nuevas Voces was looking for a data-driven community advocacy tool and didn't have the implementation skills. Second, our group needed Nuevas Voces because they understood the needs of the community. There's no point in building a tool in the name of climate justice that isn't useful to the community. And they were really looking for a multi-purpose tool that would meet multiple needs in their community. What started as just an interactive flood map of their neighborhoods became something much more layered. I actually was super scared. Me and Maria Jose, when we were on our way to Chicago and we were sitting in the, air, uh, in the airplane, we were like, oh my God, we're going to meet all these people, all these mathematicians, uh, PhD people. And we were like, probably we're not going to belong there. Probably we, we, we're not going to be... Uh, um, be part of them and then as soon as we got there they gave us a welcoming super we felt like we belonged there and and that was the number that was the number one thing that we liked because at first we were scared and then right after we felt so comfortable we were able to communicate our needs in a in a super easy way um that we felt like, oh my God, we, we, we really gonna do this. We really gonna work with them and they are gonna put all our needs in one single tool. So we, we felt welcome. Yeah, and I would be intimidated too. Traveling halfway across the country to meet a bunch of researchers, even if you met some of them previously, that's a stressful situation. I'd like to think it helped that Jenny and Maria Jose had met some of us before though. That's right. Your time at MC wasn't the first meeting of this project, was it? Now, we initially conceptualized Racina last summer when we were at ISERM, another math institute located in Providence, Rhode Island. Yeah, so for those of you who don't know, the acronym stands for Institute for Computational and Experimental Research in Mathematics. Right. And so ISERM is in Providence, Rhode Island. And for context, I proposed a research program also at ISERM because I am from the Providence area and I wanted to do community-centered data science work for social justice in my hometown. My sister, who lives in Rhode Island, connected me to WRWC, and that led to connecting directly with Nuevas Voces. Why don't we let Joseph Higdon, the associate professor at Northeastern Illinois University, explain first contact? In the summer of 2022, we met with uh, representatives from WRWC. I'm not going to say the full because I'm going to mispronounce it. Uh, while we were at ISERM, another math institute at Brown. And part of it was us trying to work with the community in Providence. We're there. We need to learn how to respect the community we're working with and also give back, give back and do some service. So Joe is part of the original group at ISERM where we were undertaking a number of projects. But one of them was to build a connection with a local community advocacy organization to support their work. While we were at ISERM, we were trying to leave the ivory tower behind. <laughs> Literally. Yeah, I mean, like we're sitting in this place of extraordinary privilege, talking a lot about social justice, but what does that mean in Providence? And today, we had to get out there and learn from the community to hear what they really needed rather than assuming we knew their needs. And that takes time, building a relationship for mutual trust. And that first summer, we were just looking for a group that we could help and that wanted to work with us. We wanted to have an opportunity to go out there and meet and discuss with them, really have a conversation and go to their place, not have them to come to us. And I think that was really important for us to go away from where we were being hosted to where they live and into their community and say, Tell us what's, what's the issues, what's going on? We don't know if we can fix it. We don't know if we can have solutions, but 
this is we're curious about using data science with that social justice lens. So that was your first introduction to Nuevas Voces. What were some of the concerns and issues that they were focused on? Well, one of the questions we asked was, what case do you have to make over and over again to convince people your experience matters? So what were some of the issues they brought up? Their answer was that there's a misnomer among those in Rhode Island. The climate change is not a social justice issue. There's a belief that coastal flooding only affects wealthy beach communities. However, some of the most severe flooding has been experienced along the Woonasquatucket River watershed in downtown Providence. Wow. Yeah, I, I could see how that clear disconnect would happen. We think of big beachfront mansions and not the downtown city watershed areas that can be hit with flooding just as hard. Right. And this flooding has increased in frequency due to climate change and due to inadequate infrastructure investment. But convincing policymakers that this flooding experience has been a struggle without, quote unquote, data to back it up. So that's where your group of researchers comes in. We wanted to help Nueva Esposas address this issue by creating a tool through a participatory design process so that they're still leading the conversation. Here's how Becca and Jenny explained it. And I think that Onlyville and Lower South Providence are the two neighborhoods in Providence that really um, need their story told louder. It needs to reach more people. And, um, and But resident control is critical to problem solving because lack of resident control is what led to the problems that these neighborhoods are facing today. So if this tool can expand resident control over what happens where they live, <laughs> then, then we will have all done our job. And it's given us that tool, given us that power of 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 being of feeling we belong in this community. We and we're gonna make it happen. We're gonna make our community healthy. We're gonna, you know, make aware our children that climate change is a real problem. So our time at ISERM was vital in building our community connections with WRWC and Nuevas Voces. We needed to have a clear grasp of what they needed from us before we could start building a tool that they would find useful. But let's go back to your month here at IMSI. Once your team arrived, how did you start to tackle the creation of Vecina? Well, the first step was having Jenny and Maria Jose join us to help walk us through specific asks and make sure that we were meeting their goals. Then we divided the work based either on what folks on the team had experience in or where they wanted to grow their skill sets. We started as a focus on flooding and watersheds, but it turned out to be a much more complex set of requests. Gotcha. So you had enough people to divide and conquer, so to speak, all these additional needs. Mm -hmm. We needed folks working on data about flood zones, local schools, additional local resources, all sorts of needs, just to name a few. I actually like how Joe described his first week at MC. Each of us have broken up into subgroups of trying to get data, trying to get information. Uh, I've been working on looking at flood zones. We just had a nice discussion about that, the 2010 flooding in Providence, uh, which is the EPA has that data. But really, how do we embed it? And then it was a, we had an interesting conversation today saying, that's fine. All this data exists, but is it accessible? Can the average person go in there and just use it? If you have all this information and all this data and all this jargon, is it really usable? So we have to really make sure what we're presenting to the community is in a usable way, but also have make sure that they have access if they want that deeper dive. And it's not that they can't understand it. It's just it, there's a time constraint for many people. It's just like, I need this information. I need it now. How can I use it? when I go talk to try to get money through a grant or if I'm trying to convince a politician that this is important or, you know, find the best school for my kids, you know, or, you know, how do I, asthma is a big issue in that area. How do I, what can I do to deal with asthma with my children? Okay, so Joe was on the flood zone duties. What about everybody else? Well, we all supported each other, but Victor worked on simplifying school choice Atelia worked on the open source systems. I worked on creating a way to read and display 
places from Google spreadsheets, which were easy for Nueva Esposes to maintain. And Sonia is working on sort of a side project on the cost of heating. I'm not gonna lie, I am still blown away by how quickly you all had to move on this project. And with so many moving parts, and all with the goal of having a prototype within a month? Yeah, we really tried to treat our month at NC as an accelerator to really get everyone working together to push Vecina forward. And you mentioned that while Vecina was started as a way to look at environmental impacts, it quickly took on other community concerns like schooling. Right. On the surface, not all of that sounds like climate change, but that is important. What we heard is that the center is community advocacy. Climate change is important, but how can you advocate for that when you're worried about your kids at school? Remember, Vecina means neighbor. And Jenny has been a Vecina in helping families with things like finding resources and helping new immigrants pick schools. Her latest concern about helping find a middle school that was a good fit inspired Victor's focus. Victor, I should mention, is a professor of Paris State University and was a lawyer before he became a mathematician. He does a lot of work in math education these days. Here, while at MC, what I've been doing is gathering and uh, data related to education. The idea being that you know, we're generating this geospatial map with different layers for the community to use. One of the layers will be education. So on the map, they'll see the schools. And I've gathered, it, it's uh, state testing data, right? So I've gathered this data, I've wrangled it, I've mangled it probably, but I've, I've uh, put it into a form that will be hopefully be make sense to the community and help them inform not only their decisions when they're filling out their school preferences for their kids, but will also help them advocate for policy changes that will make it easier and more for uh and maybe even more transparent. So there's also this whole focus on education and knowing how to select the best school for your children based on their needs. Going beyond simply filling out their preferences, I'm hoping that this data, these data will help the community advocate for policy changes that makes the school choice program in Providence more transparent and provides parents with more agency in the process. There were a lot of different streams of information that we were trying to weave together when creating Vecina to meet the diverse needs of Nueva Esposos and the communities they represent. And of course, you needed to weave them together in a pretty and intuitive way that folks could actually use. That's where Atilio Barreda came in. He's an adjunct professor at CUNY City Tech and our resident software engineer. So I am actually uh, not strictly a mathematician. I'm a software developer um, who learned late in life that I like thinking about math. Um, so I am uh, kind of know enough to talk to the math, the math people here um, and uh, kind of uh, W translate what they want or what they, uh, you know, what they're thinking about into kind of tech specs or software design. Unlike the Zuckerberg motto, to move fast, break things, we had to start slow and be very deliberate about why and how we were building a casino to make sure we were meeting Nueva Esposa's expectations. What really is the biggest lesson is that if you actually, you know, want to make software that's not just for you, it's it's a lot it's it's a lot slower a process to to be effective, um, and so instead of you know just you know day one starting to scaffold you know I want my app to do this this and this, um, we met with community partners we had uh, uh, we we uh, read uh, you know relevant uh, research that has already been done in terms of working with community partners in terms of working with you know communities of color and and refugee communities so there's a lot of um, there's a lot of kind of a priori knowledge that needs to come before we start, you know, building tools and, and picking mathematical models. So I, I know I know the answer to this question, but were you all successful? After a month at MC, were you able to take home a prototype tool that Nuevas Voces can use to advocate for themselves? Why don't we save the answer to that question for after the break? If 
you're getting a lot out of the important research shared on our show, there's another University of Chicago Podcast Network show that you should check out. It's called Not Another Politics Podcast. Not Another Politics Podcast provides a fresh perspective on the biggest political stories, not through opinions and anecdotes, but rigorous scholarship, massive data sets, and a deep knowledge of theory. If you want to understand the political science behind political headlines, then listen to Not Another Politics Podcast, part of the award-winning University of Chicago Podcast Network. Well, you've held us in suspense. Time for the big reveal? Yes! The short answer is yes. We were able to come away from MC with a functional prototype of Vecina that we can start to beta test and refine. The full product is not going to be done for some time, but we wanted to develop at least one aspect of the tool completely and get the full Nuevas Voces group engaged and get that feeling of accomplishment to keep us motivated. That's fantastic. I feel like I need to add a round of applause sound effect or something. <laughs> You should have seen Attilio at the end of our program reception. He was able to get the final piece of functionality, a text-to-speech button that Nuevas Voces had included on their list of asks because of low literacy rates in the community. It was this lovely last minute of triumph before we all left for our home institutions. I'm happy to say that we actually um, have kind of a final product um, that we made a kind of uh, a resource mapping tool for Providence. And so that is, um, it, it's uh, launched online and available. Um, and obviously we want to work on it more, but, um, you know, we were able to kind of uh, uh, start and, uh, and finish a prototype here at MC. Oh, that makes me so happy. It was down to the wire, but you were still able to come away with a finished prototype that can actually be used to advocate for change. Credit where credit is due, everyone worked really hard to make Vecina possible. But I want to point out that we weren't the only ones leading the charge. None of this would have been possible without WRWC and Nuevas Voces. We depended heavily on their community knowledge and local expertise to guide every step of the way. Yeah, I think Victor mentioned something about that. I think the role of community broadly, and by that I don't mean like community organizations, although that's important, but I think the sense of community among those working on the projects has been extremely valuable. I think we've all gotten a lot closer. Um, in our case, with our project, it's, you know, th that includes our relationships with Nuevas Voces, or at least the representatives of Nuevas Voces who've been joining us, as well as um, WRWC, but especially Nuevas Voces. I know some may think of participatory research or community research partnerships as transactional, like a formula, but I think of it as deeply relational. We were building something together that was bigger than what any of us could do alone, and that's pretty transformative. Yeah, there have been so many levels and layers of integration that were necessary for this to actually become possible. We had to start slow and deliberate in building community at ISERM and establishing the connections before we could take the running leap at NC. So you had to walk before you could run, huh? <laughs> or take a running leap as you described it. Right. But taking these deliberate steps, I think, builds a roadmap for others who are interested in doing similar community-driven data science work. Since this was a community-driven effort, perhaps our last remarks should come from them. First up, Becca's reaction to the process and progress at MC. You know, watching this come together in a relatively short period of time and kind of learning more about the expertise of some of the people involved in this project has been very eye-opening for me. So I think I just feel excited and empowered that kind of bringing this tool into being as part of a group has reminded me of what is possible when people work together. And finally, let's hear from Jenny. By the way, I recorded this interview before the end of January, but I still think it speaks to the experience as a whole. Having this type of research and work with people that they care about the community is making us feel welcome. I was thinking all this after I came back from Chicago that I never thought that you know, a little girl from Nicaragua was going to be in Chicago University talking about the needs of my community. 
And I felt like it was a great opportunity, a great experience and a great, uh, um, how do I say, a, um, yeah, a great opportunity to be able to be working with you guys. And I felt like this type of research, it's, it's pro the community, it's with the community. And I feel like we're going to do a great job on doing this uh, new tool for for communities that sometimes feel like they're not welcome because they probably they don't know the language, they don't know the uh, how to express the needs of the community. So having you guys work on something like this, I when I came back from Chicago and I talk about with my girls about everything that I did and everything that you guys are doing, I you know I got some tears because I was like, oh my god. Um, even though we think that we not we not part of the community, there's people out there that they care. So I gotta ask, what's been your biggest takeaway from this experience, Carrie? You know, like when I heard that, I was crying. <laughs> um, you know, they they ask us, what are you gonna do? What are your outcomes and products of the research? We can celebrate the prototype all we want, but I never thought on this list that maybe Jenny would talk to her girls about how great mathematicians are. I never would have thought to promise that to MC. Who thought that a 15 year old from Peru, my dad would immigrate to the US and have a kid, me, earn a PhD in math and come back and help the community in this way. If I can help Jenny from Nicaragua feel heard and not just inspire, but help her girls feel like anything's possible, that to me is the best kind of broader impact. Man, the impact isn't just building a tool and flexing some math skills, but making those real world changes in someone else's life. What, what more can we ask for? Oh, and we should do a shout out to the folks who were involved in this project, but you weren't able to record. That's right. I am so thankful to everyone who took the time to speak with me while they were rushing around here at MC. But of course, I wasn't able to catch everyone. The voices you didn't hear but contributed greatly to Vecina are Sonia at Illinois Tech, Maria Jose Gutierrez Paz at Nuevas Voces, um, and others that were part of early processes at ICERN. Maybe we'll just have to see about a reunion research collaboration workshop at MC and get an update on Vecina. Fingers crossed. Don't forget to check out our show notes in the podcast description for more on MC's research collaboration workshops and how you can submit your own proposal. And of course, there will also be additional resources in the show notes for data science projects like this that start from a community-driven perspective. And if you like the show, you can give us a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or wherever you listen. By rating and reviewing the show, you really help us spread the word about Carry the Two so that other listeners can discover us. And for more on the math research being shared at MC, be sure to check us out online at our homepage, mc.institute. We're also on Twitter at mc underscore institute, as well as Instagram at mc.institute. That's MC spelled I-M-S-I. And do you have a burning math question? Maybe you have an idea for a story on how mathematics and statistics connect with the world around us. Send MC an email with your idea. You can send your feedback, ideas, and more to sadiewit at mc.institute. That's S-A-D-I-E-W-I-T at mc.institute. We'd also like to thank our audio engineer, Tyler Dammy, for his production on the show, and the music is from Blue Dot Sessions. Lastly, Carry the Two is made possible by the Institute for Mathematical and Statistical Innovation, located on the gorgeous campus of the University of Chicago. We're supported by the National Science Foundation and the University of Chicago. The Wunas go talk at Learn Time. I'm going to Yeah, yeah, no, it's fine. The struggle bus is real every time. Also, in my head, it's like, for those of you who don't speak Spanish, aka Sadie when she went to Cuba. <laughs> Thanks. 
I really wanted to snarkily throw in, after you said the gorgeous campus of University of Chicago, I really wanted to snarkily throw in, even in January. <laughs> That'll go in the bloopers reel. <laughs> <laughs>